Hi, welcome to Tuesday Q&A. The uh, Zoom didn't record and uh, Facebook Live didn't record, so I'm trying this. It's a thing called Loom and uh, I just want to see how, how it works because I had some stuff ready for you guys and um, yeah. So, all right. So, what I saw, a question that was real important to me is that uh, somebody said they know nothing. And so they, um, they wanted to know what's, what's the first thing that you need to know um, before you start planting a garden anywhere. And my answer, my response to the person was that you need to ask yourself, are you planting to feed yourself and your family? Or are you planting for um, like wildlife, butterflies, and those kinds of things? Um, and they said that it was for their family. And they said they don't know the first thing about gardening. They have no idea. And I want to just kind of go through some basics for you. Um, I already did go through the presentation with Linda. And she said she learned a lot with my Aunt Linda. And uh, there were things that she didn't know that she learned. So maybe you'll learn something too. Maybe you already know it, but that's okay too. So um, let me see. There's my cursor. Okay. You can see my cursor on the screen. Okay. So to begin with, there are seeds, and the only things that seeds need are heat, like warmth, moisture, and soil. Heat, mo moisture, and soil. So down here, this little finger is planting in a hole, and they're going to bury the seed up. They're going to moisture it, and the sun is going to beat down on it. The soil is warm, and the seed is going to grow. Now, for beginners, uh, two different things happen with beginners. One is either they plant the seed too deep in the hole, too far down, like they cover it with too much soil, or they let it dry out somehow. And so when you plant seeds, you're going to make sure that you water them as soon as you plant them. You're also going to water them like in the morning and the evening so they stay moist. You want them to stay moist and wet so they will actually germinate. And if you do that, then the roots are going to grow. That's the next picture going up to the left, left side of the dial here, is the germination is going to happen. Roots grow first. So if your seeds seem to take a little while to grow, that's because you don't see anything on the top. They're growing the roots. The other part is if it gets cool or if the soil was not um, cool en or not warm enough to start with, then the seeds won't grow. They're not going to germinate. So at any rate, under the soil, the roots are growing. And then after the roots have grown some, then they're going to put out their leaves, their little baby leaves. They're going to sprout. From the sprout is going to be the seedling. You're going to have a stalk. You're going to have leaves. These are true leaves that give the plant uh, the energy that it needs. And then the roots are going to grow down into the soil as well. Many times also beginners get freaked out because these leaves, these first little baby leaves, they turn yellow and the other leaves are, are green. If these turn yellow, they're supposed to. That's normal. So you don't have to get freaked out over that. So at any rate, they grow into seedlings and then they show a tree and a flowers um, for the pears. The pollinators come and they spread the pollen from one flower to another. And then that causes um, the fruit to form and inside the fruit are seeds again. So that's basically how all um, plants that have fruits or vegetables, um, that's how they all work. But it starts off with seeds, okay? And God kind of made the seeds, so like that's what they're supposed to do. So as long as, again, you've got the soil, the, mo the water, the moisture, and you've got the um, heat, the seed is going to grow into what it's supposed to. A pear seed is always going to grow into a pear tree. A uh, pumpkin seed is always going to grow into a pumpkin. Um, a squash is always going to grow into a squash. Now there's some variations. Some plants, if you plant them too close together, like if you plant two different peppers together, sometimes the pollinators go from one to the other, and they kind of mix those pollination things, and you might end up with like hybrid um, plants on accident because you plant it too close together. Or if you plant your squash, different kinds of squash or pumpkins together, 
near each other, you might end up with some cross breeds. I don't want to get too scientific, but that can happen. But it all starts with your seed and your soil. Um, there was a question about annuals versus perennials. Annuals are going to only last one season and they are um, going to die back and they're not going to come back the next season unless you decide that you want to keep the seeds when they die back. If you dry them out, you could replant them and then they're going to grow again. Some people like to do that. Um, perennial is going to, you're going to plant it one year, the um, top growth above the soil line. It's going to die back. It's going to turn all brown, and it'll look like it's dead. It's not. All the stuff on top is dead, but the roots underneath are still alive, and the plant is still alive underneath the soil, underneath the snow. In the spring, all this gets cut away, and new growth appears right from the bottom. So annuals versus perennials. Now, the perennials, uh, if you plant them the first year, the first year they sleep. The second year they creep, they're kind of growing their um, roots and things like that in the ground. They're growing more roots uh, to be able to support themselves. And the third year they leap. So if these are my three my three perennials I planted, let's go this way. There's three perennials I planted in the ground. I planted one here, planted one here, and planted one here. They're going to take a little while to grow. And in the meantime, I could put annuals that are grow going to grow all the way up they're going to do their whole life cycle in the one season. They're going to fill in the spaces of my perennials while I wait for my perennials to grow. So you can get two seasons of annuals. So annuals are your melons, your uh, corn, your uh, tomatoes, cucumbers, any, any of those vegetables that we grow typically in Michigan, zone 6A slash B. Um, you can plant any of those in between those plants and I've done that and I can show you in a little bit how I've done that um, what else did I want to mention oh there are perennial vegetables and there are perennial fruits a uh, perennial vegetable that comes to mind right away is uh, asparagus and the asparagus patch if you start small it could grow pretty large um, over decades you could have a 20-year-old asparagus patch, um, and they're going to just come back every year. They're going to, once they're done with their little shoots that you've eaten, you leave some shoots, they grow up tall, and they get all frilly. And then a perennial fruit is strawberries. So if you first get into a house or you get some land or something and you want to plant right away, I suggest you start with those. Get those established. Get those going. And once those beds are up and running, you they're pretty low maintenance and you don't have to do too much to them. And some people actually, um, dog's barking. Uh, some people actually will plant asparagus and then they'll put strawberries around them because asparagus don't like weeds, weeds that compete for nitrogen in the soil, but they don't mind strawberries because strawberry roots don't go far down into the ground. And they also provide like mulch and shade. They keep the soil nice and moist and cool uh, for the asparagus. So they're both, they're also both um, doing their productivity and things usually about the same time. Asparag my asparagus now has gone to, um, it's starting to get frilly. And my strawberries in a, a bed nearby are getting a lot of flowers and they're just starting to get, they're starting to droop down, the flowers are starting to droop down and make the little berries. So you can plant those together. Those are going to come back every year. And that's a wise investment, um, and you're not going to have to replant them. Uh, you're not going to have to buy more starts. And then patio veggies, you can grow in nearly any container. The only thing you want to watch out for is that the uh, that you know how deep your uh, plant roots are actually going to get. So if it's, they have shallow roots, like lettuces, spinaches and things like that, you can go in a shallower container, maybe six inches of soil or eight inches of soil. If they're going to be tomatoes, which vine like crazy and they're going to grow crazy, then you're going to want at least 12 to 18 inches of soil in your container. So that's what's going to determine it. And you want the container to be at least a foot wide, like 
across the top. You need at least a foot wide. You're going to have drainage on the bottom, poke holes in the bottom, put some rocks or some mulch at the very bottom, and then put your um, potting soil in the top, and then you can plant your veggies. Um, if you get bush uh, varieties of like cucumbers or tomatoes, those do really well in containers and they're not going to vine out everywhere. If you get the kind of tomatoes that are like indeterminate or you get cucumbers, um, you're going to need trellises that they can climb up um, or a wall or a porch or something that they can climb on and they're just going to keep going. You could even, you could have two uh, containers nearby each other and you could actually put a trellis over the top going from one to the other. So then they can climb up and over and up and over if you like. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. Oh, the other thing with um, planting patio vegetables is you want to make sure the soil is draining really well. Um, if this is, if you decide to dump out your patio veggie soil from last year, put it, like I like to put it in a kiddie pool and like just mix it all together and use it for filler. The first year that you would use the miracle Grow, that miracle Grow fertilizer lasts about, what does it say, feeds three months, feeds six months, and then all those little pellets inside the fertilizer are going to wear out. So your soil is still going to be fluffy, but it's not going to have that fertilizer stuff in it. So if you want to dump it out, you could redo it. You could um, add compost to it. You could add some topsoil and some compost to it and mix it all around and reuse it if you like. The only problem I see sometimes with reusing it that way is that the, um, there may be insects or other pests that are inside the soil that are going to come along for the ride. All right. So let's see. Next one. Okay, Roundup. Um, I just have to say this about Roundup. I, I don't personally like to use it. I'd rather smother weeds with, like, newspaper or cardboard. Hold on, i got to let the dog... Cats fighting with each other, hissing at each other. I have roosters outside the window, and then the dog is barking at something. So, um, so Roundup. I, I personally don't like to recommend Roundup. Uh, it has been known to cause some diseases, and there's lawsuits and things that go on with that. But in the case of poison ivy, poison sumac, poison oak, oh, for sure. I think it's a great idea. And so what you want to do with Roundup is, this Roundup, is look at the package instructions. And you protect yourself with whatever they say to use, whether it's goggles or a mask, gloves, long sleeves, uh, closed-toed shoes, whatever it is that they say to do, do it. And also do it not on a windy day, okay, because you don't want it spraying everywhere and killing all the other stuff that you still want. So I have a friend who has, um, she has poison oak. And it's growing in the middle of her, um, like, English ivy and her, I think she's got periwinkle, like, ground covers. And it just kind of snuck its way in because it's a vine. So what I told her to do is she's going to gear up as if she's, you know, fighting COVID or something. She's going to have the gear on to protect her body from effects of this product. Make sure she's wearing gloves. She's going to take all the vines and cut everything all the way back down to the ground. So she just has a couple stumps. She's going to take all the vining pieces and put them in a garbage bag and throw them away. I never put them in a compost pile. And you don't want to burn them. If you burn them, then poison whatever is up in the air and you actually can breathe that in. And people have gotten poison ivy into their lungs. Not a good scene. You don't want to do that. So you're going to snip it off, put it in a garbage bag and throw it away, not compost it not just put it to the side because it's still going to have the um, the oils that cause people to have the reactions. And then you're going to go way down. You're going to go way to the very bottom, this to the very, wherever the stems are, and use the Roundup. Spray this particular kind of Roundup all over the stems. And you might have multiple places that there are stems coming from the ground because, like I said, it's a vine. So I know up at my mom's trailer um, every year, the vines would climb up the trees, but they would also creep along the ground where she had a garden. So I had to be careful. And, uh, and you don't want to 
brush off your brow with your gloved hands that's been working on poison ivy because then you're going to get it on here and you're going to get it under your eye. You don't want to touch your gloves to your phone that you've had tucked in your shirt because you're going to get it there. You don't want to wear um, sandals because you're going to get it on your feet. Huh, that's me. Learn from my mistakes. But at any rate, this, is, this works really, really well for um, these products. So if there's an area that you really want to garden and you've got these um, types of vines, it's not hopeless. This is not something I would cover up. I would want to kill it, make sure it's dead, and then I could move on and make a garden. Okay, here are your tips as far as sun and shade go and what you can grow where. If you're growing it for the fruit or the root, you need full sun. If you grow it for the leaves or the stems or the sprouts, partial shade is all you need. So if you're growing tomatoes, full sun. Peppers, full sun. Watermelons, full sun. Corn, full sun. If you're going to grow spinach or broccoli, or kale or cabbage, arugula, what else? Swiss chard. You're getting the leaves, the stems, or the sprouts, um, cilantro, then you only need partial shade. And so full sun, I think, is 10 hours. I could be wrong. I didn't look this up first. And I think partial, sh partial sun or partial shade is like minimum of four hours. And that would include like if you've got trees that are like near, near each other, but then there's some dappled sun that comes in. Just kind of see how long during the day that sun actually stays there. And that would be a fine place to put an herb bed or a salad greens bed um, and those kinds of gardens. Otherwise, you're going to have better luck with your tomatoes and, and other things that have fruit out in full sun. Um, I also have, I also have uh, radishes, but those are going to be the roots. So roots, they like the full sun. They're in with the greens right now, but I also have um, like things that are shading the greens. And the one reason we want to keep them more in the shade is they're going to last longer. Once the sun starts warming up the soil to a certain point, then those greens are going to be like, woohoo, we need to make more of us. And they're going to send shoots up. That's called, um, I forgot what it's called, bolting. They're going to send shoots up. And on the shoots are going to be flowers at the ends of the flowers, which are really pretty. But once they do that, now all the energy is at making seeds and none of it are going to be at the leaves. And they're going to taste kind of bitter at the leaves once they bolt. So if you can keep them shaded, keep them cooler uh, as long as possible, you'll still be able to harvest lettuce and harvest spinach and harvest your cabbages that you have. Okay, here's an example of um, full shade. Well, yeah, I'd say shade. That's shade. Um, your most sunny spots are going to be in the south side of your yard, whatever the south side is. So in this photo, this is for my cousin Steve. Hi, Steve. And uh, he wants to know what he can grow under at the bottoms of those trees to, like, fill in those spots. So he's looking for, like, uh, shrubs and sh flowering shrubs that like shade. So, Steve, I'm going to get with you uh, offline, and I'm going to get you information about different possibilities. Maybe I'll draw you up a design or something. Uh, so we're looking directly at the south side of his backyard, and you can see the trees are planted at the very back part of his yard, and they're casting all the shadow, all the shade up to that patio, which is great when you're outdoors and you're enjoying yourself, but if you wanted to make a garden, there's it's limited. You couldn't do as well with like tomatoes and cucumbers and um, the hot crops that we have. Um, and that also goes with your own garden. If you're going to have tall plants, you want your tall plants, um, actually with my hands, let's go this way, like where the patio is, you would want the tall plants toward the patio so they're not going to cast shade on all those um, shorter plants. And the shorter plants could be in front of those tall plants. So your tall plants go toward the north part of your gardens. The shorter plants go toward the south part of your gardens. Unless you have those greens that you want to keep shaded. So, for example, one of my beds I have, um, well, in two of my back vegetable beds, I have corn growing in parts of them. 
and those the corn blocks that are growing are going to shade my greens and and uh, over here and they're going to shade my greens over here so i have corn and it's making artificial shade to keep my greens from bolting too soon to keep them cool and keep them moist wet because they're all they're made of uh water so here's an example and okay and so the other thing i wanted to show is how simple it can be it does not have to be really complicated this is part of my garden bed it's in a corner where we just tossed um grass clippings from the from the lawnmower the tractor bags and they don't have insecticides herbicides there's no weeds and feed or anything on those grass clippings so we piled them in the back corner and we also um big burrowed uh leaves we had a whole bunch of oak leaves and i thought for sure I thought, oh, I like that we have all these bags of leaves for free. We didn't have to go looking for them. But I didn't know if they were going to break down. Well, they did. Over the winter time, they broke down. Now, we do have um, chickens who scratch all over the place. They mixed everything together real well. And they added their poop. But even if they had not added their, their little nitrogen fix, um, the the mulch provided by the grass and the leaves breaking down makes this soil fantastic underneath so if i pull aside mulch and i take a spade and i push my spade in and i pull it up there's like five or six worms in there already they're just wiggling all around and usually i end up throwing them to the chickens because you know they did their part by helping with this garden at any rate, what I did with this one is I pulled the mulch back, I put my spade in, I took a chunk of soil out and just flipped it on, like on its side, chopped it all up so it was loose, and then I took some of that soil and I made a little mound, a little hill of dirt, hill of dirt, took three delicata squash seeds and shoved them in the pile, boop, 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 and then watered them. They are going to grow fantastic. So even if your soil, your dirt, isn't like super enriched and composty and whatever it might be, even if it's just from grass, underneath grass, and you've cleared the grass away, you do this and your seeds are going to grow like crazy. As long as, like squash, because they're going to have fruit, you want them in full sun. And they're going to go crazy. So seeds, you're going to keep watered the whole time until you see some little sprouts. So you're going to water them at least twice a day in the morning and at night so they stay nice and wet. So the roots have time to go down and then the leaves have time to come up. Once the leaves come up, then I only water them once a day in the morning. And they are just going to take off. So watch this for later on. I'll show pictures of what the delicata, this is delicata squash, looks like. And again, it's soil in a little hill three seeds, water it, let the sun come, water it every day until the leaves come up. At any rate, this is in ground. Here's another in ground bed. Um, I did the same with, I have yellow squash right here and I have yellow squash over here. I'm giving them lots of space to grow. In between, I planted some bug barriers of um, nasturtium seeds and I've got comfrey over here in the back corners and what else do I have? Oh, I have some peppers back there. I've got some dill and fennel growing here. I've got some peppers up here. I've got cucumbers up in this, this trellis and in this trellis. I keep calling them pickles. And my husband's like, they're not pickles yet. Oh, yeah, they're cucumbers. One's bush kind and one is, um, oh, pickling, I think. I can't remember. Something like that. And then in the back, I have a teepee. I put posts up. And at the base of each post, I planted uh, seeds of beans. Now with these seeds, I kind of scooped out the soil a little bit to make like a little cup so that when it rained or I watered, I made sure that, that that moisture was in there for the beans themselves. And then once they start growing, they're gonna I'm going to train them to go up those posts, but they're still going to need lots of water. So, so that one is a little bit more concave, more of like a saucer to catch the water. And I did the same thing, whoops, I did the same thing when I planted the um, the peppers. I, I made the soil level 
where the plant was growing, but then I also made like a little, like a little hill going all the way around it, like a little raised wall. And again, that's to catch the water because they're, they're still little baby plants. I hear that peppers don't like a whole lot of water through the season. They like it a little bit more dry. But again, because they're babies, I want to give them as much chance as I can. So this is another in-ground bed. And with this one, uh, this snow fencing had been all the way around here. And so the flock had access all the way up in here, all winter long, all fall, all winter. And then the early spring um, is when we moved the fence over. And so I didn't till this. I didn't dig it up. I was going to broad fork it, but I got impatient. I wanted my husband to broad fork it for me, but I got impatient. So uh, I just uh, I just put a spade in, and I just lift up a spade full of dirt, a big shovel full of dirt, break it up so it's nice and um, soft, and plant away. And so far they're very, very happy. I did put the, the wood chips down because I like to make a path because if I go to harvest my beans back here and I don't have a path, I can't get to them. Or if I go in here to harvest yellow squash, I want to be able to reach them. Oh, that's not a pepper in the front either. That's zucchini right there. So I kind of have a path going around here a little bit. I know where I can step and where I shouldn't step. And the same with visitors. As long as you've got paths, there's no reason for them to be crushing your stuff. Even kids can be taught, stay on the path. But if you don't show them where the path is, you could put bricks, you could put stones, you could do, I had even just a piece of wood, this little piece of wood over here. I had that in between the squash, so I remembered not to plant something. Whatever it is, to guide your people to where you want them to be and not be. And then I do have a walkway that goes along here that squishes grass. And I'm doing that over here, too, with my walkway. And I've got cardboard over here to squish the grass. And the reason I'm doing that is because I saw there, I went to water. <laughs> it was when I went to water. And out jumps a little mouse and goes running all the way down in here. And I think he jumped into this vegetable garden and he's in my green somewhere over there. And the cats can't get to him. So I don't need any kind of hiding places for them to be so they can just enjoy themselves. I need the cats to have a chance to um, take care of them for me. All right, here's another, um, another um, photo of the pole beans with the stakes, the poles. And like I said, I'm gonna train them to grow upward. Now, they're on the outside where it's going to get lots and lots of sun. And then the inside, I put uh, cabbage and broccoli and some parsley in there. Because remember, if it's an herb, it can be partially shaded. And these guys really like the shade. And <laughs> they're a little baby plant, so I did not want to kill them off. So I had to um, plant them. I can't let them just die. Because I grew them in the greenhouse, like from seed. So to me, they're really special. We'll see. And I don't have them protected from the butterflies or, the, you know, the caterpillars or anything like that. So, well, we'll see what happens. I mean, that's what happens if you don't have mesh or covering or whatever. But I'm kind of hoping that the other things are going to distract them. I have some cosmos and things growing in there, too, that will keep them busy. Um, so this is a makeshift um, lazy garden. This is great for beginners. Great, great, great for beginners. No till, hardly any work, seriously. Um, and one reason I did this, this garden is because the grass back here by the fencing was about two feet tall. And I was not going to get in there with the weed whacker. I literally was lazy and didn't want to. So instead, I flattened all the grass down, laid the cardboard on top of the grass to hold it down, and then I added soil on top and added the plants and then watered them in. Now, I did notice it was on a little slight hill, so I added a branch here, and I added a branch in the middle just to kind of hold the soil in place. You can do this. Um, the exception I made was, um, these are sweet potato vine plants right here, so I cut holes underneath them before I, I put them on top of the grass and then just covered them up with the soil. So you can do this. You can decide where where do I want, where is the best place that I'm going to get the most sun so I can get the most 
produce I can get. Lay the cardboard directly on the grass and the weeds. Put the soil on top. You probably want about six to eight inches of soil. And on top of that, you could lay a single layer of newspaper, like weighted down with rocks. Or you could put maybe two inches of mulch on top of that soil. And then you can plant right into that soil. Don't go through the cardboard, but plant right into the soil. As these plants get larger, their roots are going to go down. As the um, microbes in the soil break the cardboard down and the water breaks the cardboard down, the roots are going to be able to penetrate in. As this grass and weeds that are underneath the cardboard die, and the roots of those grass and weeds die, they're going to nourish the plants. It's going to turn in basically into like compost and it's going to give them more nourishment and it's also going to aid in uh, breaking down that cardboard so the plants will get into the ground because remember i said with containers you want a certain amount of depth depending on the plant's roots well if you're on the ground already the plant's roots are going to be able to get down into the soil as everything else breaks down they get bigger the roots are very strong and they're going to be able to get down into there. So this is an example of a lazy garden. These are two sweet potato vines. They've already doubled in size since I planted these and they're going to, I'm going to have them climbing up the fence. And then these are Cosmos. They're really tall, but they're on the very um, far end of the garden. They're not going to cast too much shade on the other things, but they're going to give me shade when I'm out there working. Uh, butterflies will come and finches love Cosmos. I like to leave them up over the winter and so they can come get the seeds the other thing is they're going to self seed so they like to just like spread their as the seed dries off it just like spreads in the wind or from the birds lands on the ground and it likes to grow on its own but they're so the leaves are so distinctive that i could take any one of those out and i could go plant them where i want them to be all right If you want to get fancy, you can get some landscape timbers. This is, um, these are eight foot long and they're stacked too high. And then uh, my husband bolted them together. Um, you could use brackets or you could use, I don't know, another piece of wood or something if you like. So there's two on this side, there's two on the other, that's a total of four. And then these short sides are four foot. So that's one there and that's one there. So four, five, six. So six landscape uh, timbers can get you a, I think it ends up being like five by eight garden. And that's because I've got these little pieces on the insides of, whoops, of the uh, longer pieces. So six landscape timbers get you a four by eight garden if you wanted to do that. Um, and this is what we used. I like the big box store sometimes because you can order ahead of time and tell them you're coming they, t they tell you when their order's ready you tell them when you're coming you show up and they load it for you now people get concerned about pressure treated in the old days there were chemicals that could really hurt us i think like arsenic was one of them in the newer days they don't put that kind of stuff in there but if you're still leery that's fine get some landscape fabric and lay the landscape fabric over the wood if you just want to make sure Put the landscape fabric over the wood, and so there's a barrier between the soil and the wood itself. Although it will, it really is not going to hurt you. It's not going to leach into the soil. So we said there was what two, four, six. So six boards for seven dollars. That was as of today, and that's going to get you one raised bed. Just to give you an idea. Now, if you don't want to do wood. Then maybe you go the bucket way, the five gallon bucket way. Um, in here, I planted four seeds and I watered them until I see their little head. I watered them twice a day to keep them moist until I see their little leaves coming out. And then I just water them once a day in the morning. Five gallon bucket, drill holes in the bottom, put rocks or mulch at the very bottom of the bucket, fill it with the soil, plant your seeds. I actually have corn in there, sweet corn. So I have um, eight containers of sweet corn in the front yard. Remember I talked about making artificial shade for some things? 
Well, this is to make shade for my porch because our porch looks directly south. So the sun coming in is really, really bright. So I'm hoping it's going to grow up in front of our porch, giving us some shade um, and giving us some sweet corn. Here's an idea we, I loved when I saw it. Uh, old purses. They're cute. They're portable. As long as they have drainage at the bottom, like some type of drainage, not big holes, but something that will keep soil in, but the water will come out, you can plant all kinds of things in there. If you find out that this is getting eaten by critters, then you lift it and you put it somewhere else. That's okay. If there's going to be a rainstorm or something, or a hailstorm or high winds, then you take it inside or you move it where you want it to be. Um, these are a lot lighter. They're going to be a lot lighter than the five-gallon bucket. Uh, this looks like a pepper plant inside of somebody's purse. It's got shorter handles on the purse, but it still could be moved if you wanted to do that. And keep in mind, again, whatever you plant, you got to think about how deep is the object I'm planting into to make sure the roots are going to make it okay. Here are some examples of different ways of planting. I have on the very left, here's a rolling herb garden. This soil is about 12 inches deep because herbs don't need the deeper soil this very small box is for greens and the soil is about six inches deep I've got um, kale spinach and some salad greens in there I started them inside but that's just because there was freezing going on outside um, I started them inside with the soil sprinkled seeds over the top and watered it and they grew just fine and so I've been harvesting um, lettuces for since what mid March I think for greens which is so super cool um, the wood boxes are two foot tall and they're four foot four foot squares with trellises um, and I've got uh, broccoli and cabbage and um, carrots uh, parsley I've got uh, sweet peas growing on either side growing up and I actually because it was so warm here the uh, last week I planted my tomatoes in there as well so my tomatoes have like doubled in size since I put them in and they're gonna apparently they're gonna <laughs> climb the trellis at about the same time as this is this uh, peas so we'll see how that works out and then this is the in ground portion over here didn't do anything special to this soil except we had wood chips. Uh, we got a, a drop uh, from Chip Drop for $20. Um, you sign up for Chip Drop through chipdrop.com. And like um, tree service people need somewhere to drop off their chips from when they're done cutting all the trees. So if you tell them you're available to do it, you offer however much you think it's worth to you. So last year um, we got. I think it's like three yards of wood chips delivered to us and <laughs> we've been putting chips everywhere so over the winter we had um, there's like probably two inches of wood chips up in here I have perennials planted but like I said the perennials had a lot of space in between them so I planted I last year I planted. this is where I had my um, acorn squash pumpkins um, delicata squash and they started off as those little, they started off as these little tiny mounds here. And I was like, oh yeah, there's lots of room between those perennials. And they ended up taking over the whole corner. This whole corner, all of this, was all of the squashes and stuff like that. So I've got them in a different spot now. They're not going to take over. But I do, I did put um, peppers that I overwintered. I put them in the ground here. I put some more perennials so they have time to grow. I've got onions inside the cages. I've got onions and garlic, um, potatoes along here, and then I've got potatoes over in the garden over here. Our berries are all up in here. Blackberries, blueberries, and raspberries are up here, and I'm going to let them spread like a hedge. Um, but I think it was because of these wood chips, because when I pulled the wood chips back, it was like two inches, at least two inches of wood chips, Pulled the wood chips back, and again, I put my shovel in and took the soil out, and they're just worms galore. I mean, there's just so much life underneath everything. It's just, it's amazing. And I'm so glad that it, it's turned out like that. So you can grow in the ground. 
You can grow in containers. You can get fancy or you could, you know, make, or do it yourself. But again, God has created plants to grow. I mean, if you've ever seen like a weed growing through a crack in the sidewalk and you're like, how did that happen? Or you've seen a tree grow like in in rocks, like there's looks like there's no soil. How did that happen? That's because God made things to be able to grow. And you don't have to be afraid of making mistakes. I've got a lot of mistakes. <laughs> There's a lot going on. Um, over in this patch of garden here, what, and what I wanted to do, I came from the suburbs, all perennials and shrubs and things. All I wanted to do was make like a privacy hedge. This is, these are um, spruce, blue spruce, I believe. I can't remember now. I think so. They're really pokey. And the deer don't like them. They don't like to eat them. Not like they do with um, arborvitaes. And I've got some lilacs in there. I've got forsythia in there. So I wanted a hedge in the front, but I wanted to also start putting like, like other tr shrubs in there to make like a wildlife hedge. So there's nine bark and there's um, something with the V verbinum, I think. I've got... Um, Surface berry, willow, I've got all kinds of different things up in here too behind the privacy bushes. And then I planted a new maple tree. It's going to be an autumn red maple because I want to mimic nature. When we bought this area, we bought this house, this land was all flat grass. That's it, just grassy fields. So I love to bird watch and that's kind of what I was going for is I wanted to make it really low maintenance and then... I forgot it takes a while for things to grow up. So I've just been planting things inside and just trying things. Why not? So um, I have a plan for this area over here. It's going to be a pretty, I'm hoping it's going to be like a showstopper area because we have like an intersection. People come up to this road and they have to wait for a long time to turn left or right. So once they come up to here, I'm hoping that this is going to be so showy that they won't, they won't mind waiting as much. So I have expanded these beds out with cardboard, and then I just put a whole lot of wood chips, and then I took all the chicken bedding, and I put that on top as well. Killing off the grass, that's okay. Less watering, but then also creating um, multiple layers of nature. So you've got trees for the tall level, the canopy area. The trees are going to provide some shade. They're going to provide some homes for the nature. They're going to provide um, the leaf litter that falls down because in nature it just falls down and it stays there and decomposes. Shrubs for the middle layer. The shrubs are going to, this tree slows the water down, the water that's falling. It slows it down a little bit and gives things shade. The shrubs hang on to that water and keep it in this area, wherever the shrub is. And then there's herbs and plants like smaller plants underneath. So you've actually got more like nature. Nature is not just bushes. Um, nature is not just trees. If you've ever gone walking through the forest, you see all kinds of things underneath the trees that go on. And nature doesn't blow its leaves all over the place out of the forest. Things fall and they stay there. So a lot of these shrubs have tiny leaves as well that they lose in the fall. And over the winter, and I'm just leaving them there because they need to decompose like nature would do. All right, this shows you a little bit closer. This is that greens container. It's not real large, but there was a lot in there. Um, and it's actually starting to bolt a little bit because I kept it out in the sun too long. If I keep it in the sun or if I wasn't watering it, then it starts bolting. Here's that metal container of herbs, and then the two-foot kitchen raised, raised kitchen garden beds. And what I'm showing you here is these were plants I was holding on to for some uh, installations I was doing. That is west that way, that is east this way, that's south, and that's north. So our winds come crazy through the west, from the west usually, or from the southwest. And the sun is brightest from the west and from the east in the morning and from the west at night. So having them in between here, it protected them from the winds and from the sun. 
And I also like to keep watering cans out um, with the plants that need the water. So the water is going to be about the same temperature as the plants and not shock them. If I took it right out of the hose, it's going to be too cold. I, I thought, I thought my husband said the water comes out of the hose is like 50. So yesterday he said it's like 40 degrees. So imagine watering your plants that are out in the sun, you know, out in the warm weather with water that's that cold. Or imagine if, if this was not shielded, if the water can wasn't shielded from the sun, how hot that might get, and you're going to fry your plants. And so sometimes people think, oh, I've got a black thumb, but their water's too cold or it's too hot. And they didn't realize that. Um, the other thing is a side note, but I've got rain barrels. So I was always trying to fill, um, fill up the watering cans with, with rainwater. Um, so it doesn't have all the, the city chemicals from the waters or well water or whatever. So when you bring new plants home, if you are not sure where you're going to quite put them or it's not time to put them somewhere yet, put them somewhere sheltered. Um, back here gets shade so the sun would come in at like this angle and there was like a strip of shade so I could put them there as well but if I put them there then I'm gonna have the winds pounding at them as well so I had to think about that and then this <laughs> there were a couple days of course that the nights um, were gonna get 45 or less so I took <laughs> a shade cloth and I fastened it to the trellis and, or no, I would, I would lay them shade cloth over the plants, tuck them underneath the pots and stuff to try to keep them all around the same temperature. If strong sun, it was going to be super hot and the UV was really high, or if the rain was going to be really strong, then I took that same shade cloth and I actually would fasten it. So it was like at an angle, but the, the rain wouldn't get to it directly. Side view there. That hose is very messy. It really bothers my husband, but it's okay. Uh, along the house, closer to the house, is where the one um, rock garden is that I made. The full sun rock garden over here. And then over here, you can't see, is the shady rock garden that I made. And it's underneath a really mature uh, Japanese maple that they had planted previously. So not a lot of things grow well under trees. And the reason for that, one, is it tends to be shady. Two, there doesn't a lot of water doesn't get down to the plants under there. And three, it's competing with um, tree roots. I know with our Japanese maple here that every time I make a hole and I try and dig in the dirt, there's always some kind of roots that were in there. So what grows really well under there, like this, this plant right here is a lemon balm. It doesn't mind it being dry. It's good with that. These purple cat mints, they would be fine too under there. Anything that's rocky, dry, free draining, those are going to be good things to plant underneath trees. Now, uh, I did have a person who want, uh, uh, Sherry, you want to know about crab apples and what other perennials you can put under there besides hostas. So I'm going to get back with you with that on that. So I'm going to get back with Sherry. I'm going to get back with Steve. Um, on plant ideas and designs and I'll, and I'll spend a little bit more time with you all right so yeah plants under trees bushes that like shade that's what my cousin Steve wants to know about in that really shady yard um people wanted to know let's go back to here this is really really dry I'm only watering this rock garden every couple days just till they get established um, and actually today I looked out and all my little hens and chicks, my little hens are getting little chicks already. So to me, that means their roots are already growing. I may not water this at all anymore. I might just let that rock garden do its own thing. Um, and so somebody had a question about watering. Generally, everything's going to want at least one inch of water a week. And you can, like with my kitchen garden here, I actually put my finger down like two like two knuckles down and check to see if it feels wet. My kitchen garden drains really, really well and really fast so that things don't rot in it. So I'm usually watering that probably every couple days. 
I also have a lot of carrots growing in this first one and they like a lot of water. So every couple days I'm watering that. Um, the herb garden, that can go a little bit longer. It doesn't, I do check with my finger. Some people can get a, you can get a tool that you can put in the dirt and it'll tell you if you need water or not. So I don't need to water that as often. Generally things need about an inch of water a week. What you can do also is you can take an empty tuna can or a cat food can or um, something that's like, you know, short, like maybe two inches tall, but it's, it's, you know, that kind of diameter. And you can put that in your yard where you're not sure how much water you actually get from your sprinklers or from the rain. You can put that out there and see if an inch actually falls into that. And if not, you can water more. And if you've got that overflowing, then maybe you can water less. So that's kind of what you, the kind of gauge you can get. At the end of the day, like today was going to be like 88 again. I expect most of my plants are like wilted over because they're sweating out all the water to stay cool and they get wilty at the end of the day. By the morning, they're going to perk up again. If they're still not perked up again, and I may need to water them. I may need to check on them a little bit more often. Uh, how do you know if your soil is right for plants? You can get it tested. You can get a sample sent to, for Michigan, uh, we have a Michigan State Extension Office. And I think you can go to their website and order a soil test kit for like, I think it's $25. Or they send you the soil kit and then it's $25 when you send your soil back. And there's specific instructions on what to do to, um, to actually test, get samples of your soil, like different parts of your yard and what you're supposed to do with it. So you want to follow those really particularly. Now, if you have any of these containers, your soil, you get to decide what's, what your soil is. So um, I already know that my soil in these is fine because it's, it's topsoil with compost with some sand for drainage. The compost provides the vitamins, the topsoil just provides like the microbes and stuff they need. And so one, everything is gone, everything is all eaten, died off, whatever in the fall, come springtime, I'm gonna add compost to the top. I'll probably add about two inches of compost to the top. But actually for these beds, for the wooden beds, I took fluffed up, um, straw bales that have been sitting over the winter I took one in each bed fluffed them all out so that about half of the bed is full of the straw <laughs> and <laughs> it did really well <laughs> when it wasn't raining and nothing was going on yet nothing was getting watered um, or planted and so I had like half of it was straw and then the soil was about mm, I don't know maybe two inches from the from underneath this um the sideboard and now that it's been watered and getting warmer and things like that the soil has sunk down <laughs> it's sunk down maybe three or four inches so i may have to add more topsoil and sand and then the compost as well just to bring the level up again and from what i understand um, if I were to dig in that next year, this, the straw will probably be gone altogether. So I may have to add some more to the top of that. But you can get your soil tested if you like. They're going to give you like phosphorus and magnesium and nitrogen and all this kind of stuff and say, well, you could add this or you could add this. Add this per pound per square foot and add this per pound per square foot. Or you could just keep adding compost. Or you could cover the sections you want to grow with the cardboard, add the soil that you like, add the mulch. And eventually, you add in compost and you add in things to the tops, like in the no-dig or no-till or the lasagna method or the lazy garden method. Eventually, everything's going to work itself out because the microbes are going to be just right. So, just an idea. Bushes that like shade. We talked about that a little bit. Okay, bugs. If you want to keep the mosquitoes away, okay, so um, we like to be underneath shade trees because they're comfortable, but so do mosquitoes. They want to be where we are. 
So you could plant peppermint, you could plant lavender, you could plant basil, you could plant rosemary. Remember basil and rosemary, you're getting the leaves so they don't need as much sun. You could plant citronella, you could try marigolds, um, and those are going to help keep your mosquitoes away. Here's some more that keep fleas and ticks away, aphids, if you're having problems with aphids then maybe you want to add some uh, marigolds, um, basil. You might want to plant near your doorway to keep the flies away. Catnip, you might keep the bugs away, and then you might attract the cats. Uh, so those are some things you could plant underneath trees, like where or where you actually like to socialize, to help your life go better. Now, after you've uh, got your garden going, you also want to protect it from cats that might poop in your soil. That's gross. Dogs that might dig holes in your in your garden. That's not good. Squirrels that might want to bury nuts in your garden. Rabbits that might want to come and eat your garden. So I always say fences are your friends. And you want to protect what you love. You want to protect what you value. If you can, fence it and then make your garden. But actually, if you haven't grown anything yet and you just got your garden ready to go, then you put your fences up. That's okay, too, because that way you can get your wheelbarrow through, you can get your bags of whatever, you can get your wood and whatever else you got to do. But always think about protecting your investment. You know, why spend all that time planting a garden, thinking about a garden, and, and then taking the leap, and then you're not protecting it. Here's another way of protection. This is PVC pipes. It looks like with um, some chicken wire. If you've got chickens, it's going to keep your chickens out. And some people say, well... I think fences look ugly. I think cat poop in my garden is uglier. Big holes from dogs is uglier. I think chickens scratching up all my seedlings. That was very ugly. And I made very ugly faces and very ugly noises when they were doing that. But if I had fenced it, I would not have had half of those kinds of issues. So it's okay to do that. And you don't have to get real expensive about it. But you do have to be smart about it. You know? You want to keep replanting? I don't. I like to plant it one and then just have to weed and watch and water. That's it, right? And PVC, these PVC pipes is, are really, really uh, lightweight. I made one of these um, for the strawberry beds because I also, like I said, I like birds. I did not want them eating all my strawberries. So I have one over my strawberry bed. Okay, watering I talked about. Soil I talked a little bit about. Fertilizers. Um, some people swear by them. Um, to me, the best fertilizer, again, is going to be compost. It's going to be the natural stuff. Compost, um, wood chips on top. It's amazing how much, how much life you see when you pull wood chips back. It's amazing to me. But, you know, I, I'm not, if, if fertilizers are your thing, then try it. But as a new gardener, if you're a new gardener, I would just stick with like potting soil that's like the miracle grow stuff for, that's made for gardens. And then the next year, add compost. Um, but it's kind of like the human body. You know, if you're taking in the good stuff, your body has this natural immunity that happens. And you don't have to always be taking supplements or medicines to correct things. So... If your plant, like I said, at the end of the day, your plants might be wilty, well, that might not mean you need to fertilize it right away. It might just mean that they're a little dry and they're going to perk up. Or, like I said, baby plants, those first couple leaves, they're going to turn yellow. That doesn't mean you have to fertilize it. It just means that's what they do. And so don't get panicky. <laughs> you can always try and add compost and see how the plants do first. Um, there's also, I just saw somebody made a uh, tea with, um, comfrey. They grew comfrey. They, the comfrey has like these really large greeny leaves and they shredded up the leaves like in a blender and added a little bit of water. And then they just poured the goop, the compost goop, plant goop around the plants that weren't doing so well. She had them in a fruit tree guild. And she came back and showed like video like two weeks later and these were like brand new plants. They just, woo, woo, which I means she could have replanted them, but I don't think so. I think it's from the comfrey tea. Eggshells, um, that's from, that's for calcium. So way back in biology days, you learned that plant cells were like little squares, like in a wall. 
like little bricks in a wall, like Pink Floyd, bricks in a wall. So calcium helps make those cell walls very strong. So calcium helps with your stem. It helps um, keep the stems um, from snapping, like from strong winds and things like that. But it's going to take a little while for them, to, for the calcium to actually go into the soil. So you can dry out eggshells, you can pulverize them, and then you can add them to the soils. You can till them in. But like I said, it does take a little while for calcium to get in there. But if you know you're going to be planting tomatoes or what else was there? Um, tomatoes, eggplants, peppers, amaranth, spinach, cauliflower, broccoli, or Swiss chard, I guess calcium is really, really good for that. Um, from what I read here, it takes a few months for them to break down properly. Now, if you take the eggshells and you put them around the bases of your plants, they're to, to, um, to slimy pests, they're jagged little things, they're jagged, like jagged things, pokey things. So a snail, there's the jaggy pokey thing. Here you go. A snail is not going to want to crawl across that jagged po pokey thing to get to your plants so that can deter snails or slugs or other things that want to eat your plants at night if you sprinkle that around the plants and let's see pepper plants pepper plants taking the leaves off the bottom you don't have to do that unless they're diseased not like tomatoes Tomatoes, like I, I've mentioned in another video, tomatoes, I like to see like a bare stem and then like a whole bunch of leaves up here, pretty much, because the airflow is good and you don't have the leaves touching the dirt. And then the, um, the tomatoes will actually kind of grow downward too and you can see them pretty easy. But on peppers, you do not have to take the lower plants off. Um, some people, they top their peppers. So like if they've got like a main... Like if this is the main leader and they've got some side shoots, they might cut this main leader down and then more side shoots are going to grow out. But when I looked into it, cause I'm, I'm growing peppers like in the ground this year, not in buckets. So I'm a little more interested in what's going on. Um, when I looked into it, they were showing topped peppers versus just left alone peppers. And the yield was like the same, the same poundage or, whatever the metric thing is, tonnage, whatever, of peppers was growing with the tapped ones as was growing with the other ones. So I guess it's personal preference. That's tapping. But don't remove the bottom leaves. You don't need to do that. Eggshells. So that was for you, Marcy. Okay. Then natural bug protection. Natural bug protection. There are plants they call interrupters. So here's my little garden. And here's my little bug, and it's flying around, it's flying around, it's looking for cabbage. Well, my cabbage might be here, but I've got garlic, 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 and maybe some parsley over here. They're interrupters. So they're flying around, they're trying to get the sense of the cabbage, and they can't quite get it because there's all this garlic in the way. Or they go, oh, there's a parsley, I'll go over here instead. Or... Um, Whatever else kind of flowers that you might, like calendula, I think, people will plant on the outsides of their gardens. Marigold, they'll plant on the outsides of their gardens. Or like the picture I showed you where you plant uh, nasturtiums. Apparently nasturtium plants, um, besides being edible, they deter like squash bugs from coming in. Maybe they can't smell the squash or something, or maybe they're, I don't know. I don't know how that works. But that's a natural bug protection that you can do is interrupters. So in my garden, my herb bed, I've got chives coming up on like different corners. And then I've got some cosmos that are going to come up and um, some other things like that. Around my broccoli, I have onions and garlic. And then around my um, cabbage... I think is where I have the carrots lots and lots of carrots so that would be like an interrupter it won't necessarily get to the inside stuff because it can't sense it and then there are bugs that like to eat other bugs like if you have a lot of aphids then ladybugs are drawn to aphids and they'll be biting their heads off and there's cool videos you can watch 
of that happening. And there is a certain wasp, parasitic wasp, that will um, lay its eggs on the hornworm. And basically, the little larva will end up eating the hornworm and emerging as little more, more little wasps. And then the hornworm dies, and it stops eating all your tomatoes. So, and I don't know what that grows up into, but I think I might, um, I might this year get one of these and put it in the cage and just keep feeding it tomato leaves until it morphs into whatever it is to see what the, um, the butterfly might be. It might be a, a glad, a clear wing moth, but I can't remember exactly. Uh, what else? Whoops. Hollyhock weevil. Somebody had a question about that. I reached out to my hollyhock expert, and she has not had weevils. So I'm going to have to look into that a little bit further. Um, somebody wanted to know if dog pee kills your flowers. And it can. Um, I know that female dog urine can kill off your grass. That's why you would have spots in your grass. So you can either go out there every couple days and, like, rinse it real well with the hose or there are certain treats that you can give your dog to make their urine a little less acidic. Um, but that can be costly too. Like our golden retriever, they wanted like two or three um, treats per day to the dog. And I think only like 24 came in a package. So I was like, eh, I'll just keep using the hose to get rid of that. So they have other, there's other like natural ways to kill bugs that there's like sprays you can put on certain plants. Um, but it depends on what bug is, is there. It depends on what kind of spray it is. And it depends on the plant that you're going to be spraying. Like some plants are really sensitive to like, um, people will say, oh, use like cayenne oil or something like that. And so you have to be real careful about that. The best bet is to have multiple types of plants all over the place. So all kinds of visitors come, and then if they see a, a bug that they really like, they're going to eat it, you know. Or if they see, see a plant they might eat, they might want this other one instead, this distractor, the interrupter that you put in there. Um, or they're going to fly around, and they're going to see that there's marigolds there, and they're like, ew, that's stinky, and they're going to leave. Or uh, I think it was um, catmint. If you put cat mints like out in the orchard, they come in and it's stinky and they don't want to be here. Interrupters. Uh, potatoes. Marcy wanted to know when to hill them. And when they're about six inches tall, you're going to hill them the first time. And then about two weeks later, you want to hill them again. And what you're trying to do is to keep any of the new little potatoes that are forming, they call them tubers, but any of the little potatoes, you want to keep the sun from getting on them. You just want to protect them from the sun. So first, when they're about six inches tall, then you can hill them. And then two weeks later, you're going to hill them again. And then with potatoes, they're going to flower. They have cute little flowers on top. And then they're going to die back. And when they die back is when you're ready to harvest all of them. You could harvest new potatoes, while the stems are all still alive, if you want to, they'll just be smaller. Um, but anyway, that's the hilling. Bulbs. If you want the spring bulbs, you're going to be planting spring bulbs around Halloween. So, I don't know if you can think about, like, trick or treat. Like, you look at a bulb and it's not growing because it's not time yet. It's like a trick, a treat, something like that. Anyway, around Halloween is when you're going to plant them. So, count backward. Like, if you're going to order them from a company, uh, my sister's done Michigan bulbs, and she's had some really good luck with them. If you're going to order them from a company, then you think about how long does it take for them to ship them to you, and then that's how, when you need to order them. Um, do not plant spring bulbs now in our zone, zone A, B of Michigan, because they're just going to sit in the ground and rot. It's too warm for them, and there will be too much rainfall, and the ground is not frozen salad so they're going to rot so we plant them at um, Halloween because the ground is just about it's either had a hard freeze or it's going to have a hard freeze and the plants are going to have time to get settled in where they are and ready to go and use their winterizing process 
so that they're coming back in the spring. Now, you can plant summer bulbs now. You can order summer bulbs, and you can plant summer bulbs right now. You could plant fall bulbs right now. I mean, we're still young. We're, we haven't even passed Memorial Day, so you have plenty of time to do that. So if you wanted to try doing um, dahlia tubers, you could do those. You could do gladiolas. Um, you could try oriental lilies. They're in a bulb form. Um, those would be okay to do too right now. But otherwise, the spring bulbs, you got to think a little bit ahead. Put it on your calendar. Halloween is when you're going to plant your spring bulbs for our area. Oh, I just want to make sure I got everything else. Pull up note, got that. Okay, I think I covered. Oh, um, how far back do you trim a rose bush? Don't trim your roses right now. Unless they're going to poke you in the eye or they're poking you somehow. Um, we should trim our roses when the, in the springtime when that yellow forsythia bush blooms. That's when you trim your roses. So they're usually, they're still sleeping. They haven't gotten their leaves kind of coming out yet. But even if you waited a little too long and they're starting to get leaves, you want to cut them back to about mm, six inches and then let them sprout out. And don't cut them back in the fall. If you cut them back in the fall, the six inches, then the six inches part dies, and then the roots can die, and you won't have a rose next year. But if you let the foliage be over the winter time, and then cut it back in the spring, the plant has a better chance of um, of living. Now, if you don't like your rose, yeah, you could cut it back right now. Uh, I, there's no guarantees what's going to happen to it. That's not typically when we cut them back. And... I think that was all the questions. There's a couple people, like I said, I'm going to check with online. And I'm so bummed that the Zoom didn't work for recording because Aunt Linda was here. She showed us her pathos plant. Pathos? pathos. Oh, shoot. Now I'm going to have to have her tell me again. Um, but it's growing like crazy inside. She's doing a great job with... Um, with household plants inside plants which I can't do so I love to have her on and show us stuff and she updated us on the lilac too and it seems to be booming pretty well so things are going well with that and like I said this is my first uh, loom presentation so um, I don't know we'll see how that goes uh, a couple things I did learn I'm gonna have to I gotta get zoom I'm gonna get this subscription for zoom and if I'm going to use my laptop and the phone, apparently i got to do my laptop first and then have my phone as a guest. I'm learning. You're learning. Thanks for bearing with me. But at any rate, that is all I have for you today. And I just hope that you're learning and growing. Learn, grow, learn, grow. And take a chance because... Life is too short to not try something. Just try something new, even if it's something small. Even if you grow one foot by one foot this year, put cardboard on, put some soil on, put a couple plants in there, see what happens. Take my word for it. Um, now, when you do lay the cardboard, take all the tape off, take the staples off, take any rope off. So it's just plain cardboard, but um, try it. If you don't have cardboard, lay newspapers down. Something to smother the existing area. But try something. Learn and grow, learn and grow. And happy gardening. Bye.